welcome to Prodigal and the Priest and me, a podcast about faith, sports, and two friends from different cultures. My name is Joey Scansella, joined by my co-host, Father Paul Bechter. Father Paul, how are you doing? Doing good, Joey. How are you doing? I am doing pretty well. We record this on Thursday, and it comes out on Friday, and tonight is another so uh, we return the NBA tonight with some uh, doubleheader of games. Um, so that should be fun. And I'm excited about the questions that were submitted today. Yeah, they're good questions. They're good ones. There's some fun ones and there's some really good uh, deep uh, faith related questions. And so um, yeah. once again, if people want to submit questions, you can do it one of two ways. Um, you can or really multiple ways. Um you can hit us up on our social media at St. Anne's, um, on our Facebook at St. Anne's, on our Instagram at St. Anne Catholic. You can go to our website, stannanparish.org slash PTP, um, Prodigal and the Priest. Yeah. And then, um, or you can email us directly at prodigalandthepriest at gmail.com. And we've had some really, um, we had your infamous uh, 2D shape question submitted there, which you which you loved and uh, the greatest question, the greatest question. Um, so yeah, please reach out to us. We love answering these. We love talking about these. And there is even a area to be anonymous. If you're courageous enough, we'll start mentioning your first name. So Ooh. let's get into but it. We're not going to give out your address and your phone number. Not this episode. And social security. No. Next one. Yeah. We do collect all those things, by the way. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so uh, Nina asks this question. Seems like there's many obstacles to women becoming nuns or sisters, religious sisters, compared to men becoming priests. Some of these obstacles would be financial constraints, um, would be that they seem to need to have like a certain value before they can enter the convent. Um, what are our thoughts on this? Mm. Yeah. And the question is compared to men becoming priests. Yeah. Specifically right. a guy um, once entered the seminary um, and let's just take Dallas because we know there's many dioceses, mm -hmm. there's many different rules and things like that. Um, but I'm kind of with Nina on this. You know, it seems a little unjust that, you know, you, uh, well, let's take you, for example, let's, let's just break me. it down. And uh, don't want to pry into your financial life, but let's just say hi hypothetically, you went to UD mm -hmm. and you were carrying debt from UD, okay? And I don't mm -hmm. know if you paid for your college or didn't, but you had debt and you were like, I want to enter seminary. Mm -hmm. Would seminary have taken you? Yes. In, in Dallas, in the Diocese yes. of Dallas, they would have taken you mm -hmm. with your debt. Right. Compared to... I've never really met any religious sister groups or, you know, and, and I say I want to differentiate nuns and sisters because there is an actual technical little difference. But so we'll use those terms, you know, um, you know, together. Um, but if you're going to join the convent, you wanted to enter, every penny has to be eliminated first. Yeah, probably. Um, I, I think it depends on the convent. Okay. And it also depends on the diocese. But yeah, in, in general, um, religious orders, especially uh, religious orders of sisters, which tend to be smaller groupings. Right. Um, in general, they want you, in, in general, they just can't afford to take on uh, like student loans, for instance. Um, but, yeah. and, and so, so, you would have to get your debt squared away, and you would also have to have a certain level of education normally. Right. So we'll take a seminarian <clears throat> who doesn't have, I mean, you know, I, I've met a bunch, and there's some great ones. Mm -hmm. But there's some that, like, don't have social skills, don't have, like, a ton <laughs> of things. And we accept them right out of high school. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. It does seem, you know, like it's a great question that I love debating and just tossing yeah. in our thoughts of, and I don't know how to fix it. I mean, I have an idea or two, but um, yeah, it doesn't seem fair. Yeah. seems a little bit like sexism in the sense that like, okay, well, great. A guy can join and he can even go through a year or two of seminary, which if I believe this number is correct, um, I think it costs us about $55,000 to maintain a seminarian for a year with housing, with school, with everything. Depends on whether where they go to school. Okay. That's a 
if we send them to it. Rome, then it's more. Oh yeah, it's like you know, it's like five hundred thousand a year. 000. Yeah. So, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> you know, and then that seminarian drops out, and I don't know the policy in Dallas. I don't know if that's a public policy, if we're even allowed to say it. But you know, like. I don't think they're necessarily like there's a hard line, like give us that money back either, mm-hmm. you know, because we want to encourage discernment. And that's where I boil down to this. Like, are we stopping women from encouraging um, to enter religious life in the same way? Like we're not doing that for men. We're saying, check it out. There's not a going to be a ton of obstacles in your way, but for women there is. Mm-hmm. I think, well, first of all, I agree with you. Like in a in a in a better world, <laughs> um, this kind of thing should not be an obstacle. But unfortunately, it is. Um, and I think it's helpful for us to flip the question a little bit. Okay. Uh, to see, like in general, when you are entering religious life, um, or in many places, also diocesan seminary. So we need to make a distinction there, I think, because a lot of people don't know the difference. Like, there's religious orders, right? Like the the Benedictines or the Jesuits or the Dominicans or whatever order, and those can be for men or for women. Right. And they're primarily about uh, making the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, um, consecrating yourself in this direct way, towards Christ and living that life out in community right? according to this rule of life that you've taken on. That's what they're for. That's a different thing than priesthood. Um, one can become a priest as a member of a religious order, mm-hmm. um, but priesthood is uh, kind of a laying down your, your life in service to the people. It's for the sake of making others holy. Right. And religious life is for the sake of making yourself holy and so sanctifying the world through that total consecration of yourself. So making that distinction, right? Um, Like somebody could become, say, a Dominican. Right. And would, and a man who became a Dominican would probably become a priest. Um, But that's not the primary purpose of becoming a Dominican. Right. Um, Diocesan seminary is a different thing. Um, It's... You're talking about parish priesthood, and we don't make these vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. It's not, you're not entering the religious state. And I know that language sounds strange to people, but it's a technical distinction. Right. And it actually does matter um, because there's no, like, for religious orders, there's men and there's women, right? Different religious orders yep. for men and women. Uh, but for Dasis and priesthood, there's not like a, like a, an, a corresponding order for women because right. it's this is parish priesthood right um and so okay having that distinction in mind um it's my understanding that for the most part when you join a religious order um like they can't take on a ton of debt because it's the religious order themselves um right. who have to pay it off right um and so it depends on the order. Maybe the Jesuits are different because historically they have a lot more sort of money and they're a much bigger religious order worldwide. Right. But to join like a Carmelite convent, for instance, they're right. not bringing in any money. Right. Um, and so that becomes an obstacle. I think that's, sorry, let me get to the point. No, you're good. If we take that as the norm and then say there are certain organizations where they're able to, for the sake of promoting vocations, assume some of that debt. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are the exception. And so a place like the Diocese of Dallas kind of is the exception um, to this. And I wish everywhere could be the exception because it's, it's a really, it's a really wonderful gift uh, to be able to pursue this call uh, to a vocation and not have, uh, this immediate, extremely formidable obstacle of a lot of student debt. Right. Um, there are other dioceses that will make you um, take out a student loan that you have to pay back if you leave seminary. Right. Uh, sort of an insurance policy kind of thing. Yeah. 
uh, so that you're not just getting a free education and then leaving. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I'm interested in seminary. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, because then you can get a liberal arts degree in philosophy and then work as a waiter or something afterwards. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Y'all know I love the liberal, liberal arts. Um, <laughs> but I did just rant last time about how it's not practical, and that's why it's amazing. Right. Um, anyway, I, I hope the distinction I'm making makes sense. It's like... Yeah, I think it's pla- important. A, a yeah. place like the Diocese of Dallas is kind of the exception. Okay. Um, especially when you start looking worldwide at the mm. way religious orders work. Because um, are there kind of like diocesan... There's diocesan priesthood in other countries, correct? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. And that, we would say, largely is not handled like the Diocese of Dallas probably with right. those priesthoods, you know, and, and depending on, you know financial situations right and the diocese countries. of dallas has here's the thing they've they've taken they've made a top priority um the promotion of vocations such that uh they're willing to assume the risk of somebody not going all the way through seminary mm-hmm. um and taking that on as for the specific debt question like how much debt they'll assume um uh, how much of your own debt? I'm mm-hmm. actually not sure of the answer to that. We got to get Father Edwin in on this. Yeah, we, I think he's the one to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, um, and we would have him in for a podcast, but he's very long winded, and we try to keep to thirty minutes. Yeah, way yeah. more long winded than I am. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. Well, but, but here's here's kind of a concluding yeah. thought on yeah. that. Um, as far as well, actually, how am I going to say this? Concluding thought would be. As far as discerning a vocation, there's two, two very important things to keep in mind. First is, do I want to do this? Like, has God placed this desire on my heart yeah. to forego these things, these things like we've talked about this before, yeah. uh, to forego a, a, a real good like marriage for the sake of the kingdom, consecrating myself directly to Christ in this way, yeah, um, celibacy or consecrated virginity. Um, that's one thing. Do I want this? But then am I able? It depends on the specific situation. Like sometimes am I able, um, if somebody has a lot of debt and the specific religious order says like we can't take on that debt, that, that really yeah. does factor in. Um, right. And I wish it weren't the case. And I, I don't want anybody to hear this and say, well, I guess, you know, I'm never going to be able to pursue this desire. Right. Um, God can open a lot of doors uh, in very unexpected ways. Right. And so definitely try, but just recognize that like right. we're not in an ideal situation. Um, I think that's the part just, I'll be honest, that bothers me is like, can't we figure something out? Like pair dioceses that value this or, or do you have the financial means with some religious order? You, you, you know, I know it gets complicated. Mm-hmm. I'm making it so much simpler than it is, but yeah, I just... Internal governance you know, yeah, of like, religious orders and their autonomy and stuff. But I think I see where... You, I Okay, let me just put it like this. I want more religious sisters yeah, out and that, there. Yeah, and I hate that enough. they get called... <laughs> they call up a convent... And I don't, okay, maybe they don't actually call because they might be praying and not answer. But they talk to somebody <laughs> finally in the vocations department of a convent. And, they, and and it seems like the first two questions are, you have debt? Yes or no? Do you have an education? Yes or no? And that's just not the case, it seems, for young gentlemen. You know, and, yeah. and that's the part for me. Yeah, it seems. Gosh, I'm a guy. Like, you know, like, uh, but I'm siding here you know, with the ladies to say, it just seems like, yeah, I want more religious sisters. I think the world is going to be a holier place yeah. <laughs> if we have that. And no, so it's better for everybody. Um, yeah. Um, so we appreciate this question. We could do a whole episode on it. Thank you, Nina, for submitting that question. Hope we didn't make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Not um, sure if I helped. <laughs> this is awesome. This person put their first name as biggest and their last name as fan. So biggest fan submits. Why didn't you name the show PB and J or did it even come up? Could have stood for Father Paul Bechter and Joey. Yes, we, yeah, we get the PB and J. Yeah, just saying, missed opportunity. What do you have to say to that? Um, well, we did consider it briefly. Did we? I I, I did. Oh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know. There's just. I, I'm kind of like, yeah, missed opportunity. Oh. <laughs> that would be cool. 
I don't know. Prodigal of Breeze. Maybe we should have. That was a great question. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe yeah, we should okay. have you on our uh, media and content team here <laughs> at right. St. Anne's. But yeah, it was good. Yeah. I, I think we've settled on something. Well, the one point we would say actually practically why we initially changed as people probably heard from learning to read was if you typed in PB and J, you know, like, like nothing Catholic is probably going to pop up or, you know, we were like the prodigal and priest thing. At least it's going to generate something on the tags and stuff like that. So great question. Biggest fan. We love you. Keep, keep it up. Keep submitting. Um, I love this religious question. What if I do not feel, and this is anonymous. What if I do not feel forgiven after confession of mortal sins? And even after doing my penance, just praying a few prayers does not feel like enough. Mm, yeah, that's because it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, because the penance is not about forgiveness of sins, right? The forgiveness of sins is a free gift that we receive in confession. Uh, the penance is our participation Boom. in um in at least symbolically, but a real participation nonetheless, um, in trying to restore justice right. uh, for the wrong that we've done. Um, okay, a couple couple points on this. First of all, you can always ask the priest for more penance if you're like, that's not enough. Um, I tend to go easy on the penance side because... That surprises me. Well... You seem like the type that would go hard. <laughs> Um, I think it's easy. I don't know. Um, you're like, I just gave five rosaries. It's easy. <laughs> it's just, you, you meet a lot of people in confession who don't seem terribly comfortable with like basic prayers. Um, and after that happens often enough, you start checking to make sure whether people know, know how to do the penance that you're giving. It's very important that people are able to do a penance and know that they're done with it. Right. And because um, if they don't do it, they should confess that next time. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And so something really vague as a penance, like do good to others. Like, wh- how do you know when you've done <laughs> when you're actually yeah, done yeah, with yeah. that? Um, Which actually, surprisingly, I'll just as the recipient of the forgiveness, yeah. I get things like that a lot. Like, right. Just help somebody out. OK, yeah. like like what? Save their puppy or like how am I help take out their trash? Like. Help them with a Help kid with their the road. yeah, like with their homework. Like, I, I thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's important that penances are able to be done, hopefully done, uh, relatively quickly, um, like within a, a decent time frame, and uh, that you know that you're done with it. It is also, and and I'll assign this for people um, where I can tell, like, they're it's going to be helpful for them to have to engage with something for several days or over the course of of some weeks, um, but I'll always ask them first, are you okay with this? I think this would be helpful for you to say these prayers every day right. and to keep coming back, have a recurring thing. I think it's going to help you work through this and, um, yeah, keep remembering kind of uh, what's in the past, but also uh, this great grace of God for forgiveness that he's actually forgiven you of these things. Right. Um so that's one. The other aspect is um, in confess, like the whole reason we have the sacrament of confession right. is so that we have certainty regarding the forgiveness of sins. Like God can forgive us our sins. Um, say this carefully. Uh, apart from the sacrament of confession, but we don't know for sure. And in any sort of Prayer to God for uh, what's called the grace of perfect contrition, mm-hmm. where we repent of our sins out of love for God. That's something we can only do out of sheer grace, first of all. Right. Um, and we never really know when we've done it. Um, like, how do I know when I've been given that grace? Right. Um, and so this is this is what i'm explaining we know because in persona christi the priest says right i absolve you right like um, not i father paul like i like christ yeah christ speaking absolve you. Yeah. this i um and mic so, drop oh oh i thought no, you had an I, actual I, drop i thought uh, i did oh i did i had the volume down try it again <laughs> that's just more of a sports <laughs> center non- mic non-sequitur. drop non-sequitur there you go um, 
Are you trying to psych? Are you trying to move on to the next question? I've, yeah, I've got no, one no. more thing to yeah, say. Yeah, go for it. Um, so this is what I'm saying. Say you find that you've fallen into serious sin. What you want to do immediately is <laughs> go and pray and ask God for this grace of perfect contrition. Um, basically make a confession there in that moment to God. God, I'm sorry for doing this. I knew that it was wrong. I knew what I was doing and I did it anyway. Right. Um, please forgive me. Make an act of contrition there and then make the resolution to go to confession as soon as you can within reason. Right. Right. It doesn't mean like drive all night across, you know, the state that's not within reason. Right. But as soon as is reasonably possible, you make that, um, resolution to go to confession. Um, it's possible that God gives the grace of perfect contrition in that moment and mm-hmm. forgives that sin, but we don't know. And that's why we have the sacrament of confession. That's, that's the great gift of the sacrament of confession is to have that certainty that when you get up there, even if everything like flies out of your mind, as soon as you walk into the confessional, um, that as long as you adequately prepare before you go in and confess what you can remember and don't intentionally hide any serious sin right. uh, while you're confessing, you have certainty, as much certainty as we have for anything in this world right. um, in the life of faith, you have the solemn word of the church that Christ forgives you of your sins, all your sins, even those that you forget in that yeah. moment. Um, it does take a while for that to sink in experientially and psychologically sometimes for us to feel forgiven. Right. But we have to keep making an act of faith that God actually does forgive us in that moment. So it's distinct from penance, but penance can, can aid right. us in that process. Yeah. And it also is important as um, a participation in restoring justice. Yeah, there's nothing we could do to be like, there's not enough rosaries and not enough prayers, not enough things that could ever, yeah. you know, Th- that's not the forgiving part. It's yeah, not we don't earn our forgiveness it. by the amount of prayers that we say. Right. Uh, certainly not. Um, and then final thing is, uh, a lot of people seem confused on this, but like, once you receive absolution, the forgiveness of confession, you're you, forgiven. You're forgiven and can go to communion, for instance. You don't have to say the penance first. Um, the penance is not... Yeah. Uh, like you do have to say the penance and if you receive a penance and say to yourself in your mind, I have no intention of saying this, you're making a bad confession. You might be invalidating it. Right. Um, Which is good to say, can't you also say to the priest? I don't want that. Yeah. Like, Give me something else. I didn't that I know do. that. There was a time like uh, a priest said to me like, okay, I want right. you to journal 30 days. And I was like, What? 30 days. Yeah, you've talked and about that before. I've talked about that before, and I'm like, that's a lot. Now, that it ended helped up me. It ended up being platform. good, all of that. But so it's totally within the person's right to say that. Yeah, you can say, I don't want that. Can you give me something else? Or I can't do that. Can you give me something else? You can also say, that's too light. I think I would benefit from having something heavier. You're like, go put on this yoke. That's right. Wear a hair around. shirt. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All great. Okay. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go an easier one. Edward asks, um, what is the most famous golf course you guys have played at? Um, mm. What is the most famous? So I played um, at the Byron, uh, where the Byron Nelson was, used to be held um, mm-hmm. in Las Colinas. Um, so on that TPC course, that's really the most famous one. Um, hashtag poor youth minister. So can't play on a lot of other courses. What about poor youth you? minister for life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Father Paul. Um, I was, I was very blessed growing up in Bermuda to have a variety of, of really nice courses there. One of them is called mid ocean and is uh, somewhat famous in the golf world designed by a famous architect. Um, and, uh, because I played in Bermuda junior golf, it was a league where you you pay at the beginning of the year and you get to play in a tournament every Saturday uh, morning, clog up the course with all these juniors playing Nice um, at these really beautiful courses. So that, but then also part of junior golf was I got to take a trip to Pinehurst when I was maybe 15 or 16 mm. for about a week and do like a golf camp there Cool through Bermuda junior golf. So people that don't know that's, Pinehurst, that's, that's like a U.S. open quality course, Pinehurst number two. 
Um, it's it's quite famous. It's in North Carolina. Um, and it was incredible. It was like definitely the best course I've ever played. So one course, if if you could play any, like right now, like somebody is like, here's whatever money, go play this course. Uh, like what would it be? Ooh. Me, uh, it would be Augusta. Yeah, I was going to say Masters. that, but then I was like, but also Europe. St. Andrews. I'll go St. Andrews. Yeah, I'm torn between like St. Andrews and Augusta. It seems like the two most iconic. Yeah. So anyway, great question. A trend question. European. <laughs> we know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Edward. Great question. We love it. Um, all right, here's the question. You want to go spiritual or sports for the last question? We have time for one. Man, let's go. let's go sports. Sports. So anonymous person asks, um, Joe Kelly, pitcher for the Dodgers um, uh, the other night, did not hit, did not hit two, two Astro batters, but right. threw over their heads very fast. Behind their head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was suspended eight games. Now, Ken Rosenthal of Major League Baseball, um, uh, he's like an analyst and, and yeah. person, he tweeted that the equivalent of that in a full season would be 22 games. Yeah. Like in the shortened season of 60 games, right. uh, eight is enormous. This has, I mean, because I follow so many sports things, like this is blown up. I'm shocked at the amount. And, and you know, we talked about it first before it was popular back in a previous one. But right. I'm shocked in the amount of people that have, you know, the emotions of he should have got zero games. They should have tossed him out. He could have killed somebody. You know, like it, it is like raging emotions. I even saw on um, Ken's Twitter feed um a bishop replied Which i got bishop? um i'll look it up why we're uh, <laughs> why we're talking but wow. a bishop replied being like you know uh yeah you shouldn't do that essentially <laughs> but That's funny. i mean what are your thoughts on it i'm very torn that uh, y'all know i mean nikki my wife my mother-in-law diehard astros fans like mm-hmm. and so I totally, I'm, there's a sympathetic side towards them. And yes, like, do I think they still would have won the World Series? Yes, they're a great team either way, all these things. And Joe Kelly wasn't even on the Dodgers team that right. lost. And Joe Kelly has a video out of him missing his own pitching thing and breaking his window at his house. I, I don't know if you've ever seen that video. But I'm like, eight games when the guy didn't even hit somebody? People are like, he could have killed someone. When was the last time in Major League Baseball saw somebody die? Right. People throw at batters all the time. Yeah. I'm just like, was eight games just? I think no. Does any of it have to do with the brawl afterwards? Because he was like yelling stuff at people. Like he looked like a crazy person once the bench <laughs> right. is empty. I think empty. part of the problem is now with no fans, with no noise. Oh, you, you can, can hear, hear everything? Everything apparently. And so like the cameras, I mean, it's almost gone, you know, uh, explicit rated you know on some of those things right. i heard on first base people yelling things back and forth and so apparently um he said something to uh correa at the play mm-hmm. like nice swing yeah expletive expletive um yeah i don't know i don't know what all they're factoring into this definitely throwing at <laughs> some batters on a team that deserves to be punished and everyone agrees because they cheated and won the World Series. Um, and you're kind of like it, an Astros fan. Kind of. I, I, I go really back and forth now. It's Yeah, but... Right, but you have but stronger I have, ties. I have historic saying, yeah. ties to the Astros. I grew up as a very strong Astros fan. Uh, and then just drifted away. Fallen away Astros fan. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Thr- I, I think eight games, which is the equivalent of 22, you said... That seems twenty two in a regular season. Outrageous, yeah. completely unjust, um, for the action itself of throwing behind the batter. Like as terrifying as that is, just put it in the context of what's acceptable in baseball, and that's not that's not a crazy thing to do. So I found the tweet from the bishop. Bishop Thomas Tobin, native of Pittsburgh, it says in his bio, and he is the Bishop of Providence, Rhode Island, said, Major League pitchers have to stop throwing at the Astros. Uh, Especially now when there are so many other challenges to pro sports. Someone's going to get seriously hurt. Lawsuits and criminal charges will surely follow. Well, I mean, if 
maybe if somebody did get seriously hurt. Right. But, but like that's my thing. People are just, like, you could have killed someone. It, yeah, it seems could've. like people are paying attention to baseball for kind of the first time right now. I I don't know. This just yeah. this it's just tough. it's like the issue of whether it should be permitted this kind of retaliation in baseball is a different issue than this specific instance. Right. This instance maybe could spark something and right. I don't know how I feel about that even because like there's something there's something good about like, you know, you don't <laughs> you don't do thing uh, you don't show attitude to us, otherwise we'll throw at you kind right. of stuff. Like, there's something good about that in baseball, as long as it's kept within reason. Um, but that's a that's a separate issue than, like, given just the standard and expectations for how baseball works right now, right. is this a just penalty in exactly. games? Um, I don't think so. Not unless yeah. they got a whole bunch of stuff on camera uh, later from the brawl, and they're like, right. this is super... It, to me, Nikki made a good point that is like, was it the brawl though more than the pitches, which made me think I was like, yeah, I, I can see that of like instigating that brawl, you know, right. especially where it's like everybody social distancing. Let's fight. Yeah. Yeah. So I can see this as a message for two things from the MLB. First is, OK, ease up on the Astros a little bit, um, but more so we're in a pandemic. Don't be starting brawls. Um, because we're barely hanging on with this season as it is. And when both benches empty and everybody's pushing and shoving and spitting at each other and whatever happens in brawls, um, like, like you're going to destroy the entire MLB season by instigating something like that. If that's their reasoning, I'm kind of okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the reasoning behind, but I love debating that question. I think it's been great. And, uh, yeah, those were great questions, everybody. So we want to encourage you to keep on submitting those through our social media, through our Gmail account, prodigalandthepriest at gmail.com and stamparish.org slash PTP. Love the questions. Y'all are awesome. On behalf of Joey Scancella and Father Paul Bechter, take care. God bless.